Hello and welcome back to Old Yarn Vidcast. Today's reflections and haikus come from Shadowings by Lefkadio Hearn. Um, copyrighted in 1901 in Boston by Little Brown and Company. But of course the haikus greatly predate the compiling of them in this book. Now, unfortunately, I don't know Japanese, so we're going to be using Google Translate to hopefully roughly articulate how it's supposed to sound. This first one comes from a Japanese love song. The voice having been all consumed by crying, there remains only the shell of the semi. A celebrated Chinese scholar, known in Japanese literature as Riku An, wrote the following quaint account of the five virtues of the cicada. 1. The cicada has upon its head certain figures or signs. These represent its written character's style, literature. 2. It eats nothing belonging to earth and drinks only dew. This proves its cleanliness, purity, and propriety. 3. It always appears at certain fixed time. This proves its fidelity, sincerity, truthfulness. 4. It will not accept wheat or rice. This proves its probity, uprightness, honesty. 5. It does not make for itself any nest to live in. This proves its frugality, thrift, economy. We might compare this with the beautiful address of Anacreon to the Cicada, written 2400 years ago. On more than one point, the Greek poet and the Chinese sage are in perfect accord. We deem thee happy, O Cicada, because, having drunk, like a king, only a little dew, thou dost chirrup on the tops of trees. For all things whatsoever that thou seest in the fields are thine, and whatsoever the seasons bring forth. Yet art thou the friend of the tillers of the land, for no one harmfully taking aught. By mortals thou art held in honor as the pleasant harbinger of summer, and the muses love thee. Phobius himself loves thee, and has given thee a shrill song, and old age does not consume thee. O oh, thou gifted one, Earthborn, song loving, free from pain, having flesh without blood, thou art nearly equal to the gods. We must certainly go back to the old Greek literature in order to find a poetry comparable to that of the Chinese on the subject of musical insects. Perhaps of Greek verses on the cricket, the most beautiful are the lines of Melinger, O cricket, the soother of slumber weaving the thread of a voice that causes love to wander away. There are Japanese poems scarcely less delicate in sentiment on the chirruping of night crickets, and Malager's promise to reward the little singer with gifts of fresh leek and with drops of dew cut up small sounds strangely Japanese. Then the poem attributed to Anite about the little girl, Myro, making a tomb for her pet cicada and cricket, and weeping because Hades, hard to be persuaded, had taken her playthings away, represents an experience familiar to Japanese child life. I suppose that little Myro, how freshly her tears still glisten after seven and twenty centuries, prepared that common tomb for her pets, much as the little maid of Nippon would do today, putting a small stone on top to serve for a monument. But the wiser Japanese Maro would repeat over the grave a certain Buddhist prayer. It is especially in their poems upon the cicada that we find the old Greeks confessing their love of insect melody. Witness the lines in the anthology about the Tedix caught in a spider's snare, and making lament in the thin fetters until freed by the poet, and the verses by Leonidas of Tarentum picturing the unpaid minstrel to wayfaring men, as sitting upon lofty trees, warmed with the great heat of summer, sipping the dew that is like woman's milk. And the dainty fragment of Malinger, beginning, Thou vocal tedix, 
drunk with drops of dew, sitting with thy serrated limbs upon the tops of petals. Thou givest out the melody of the lyre from thy dusky skin. Or take the charming address of Evanus to the nightingale. Thou, Attic maiden, honey-fed, hast chirping seized a chirping cicada, and bearest it to thy unfledging young. Thou, a twitterer, the twitterer. Thou, the winged, the winged. Thou, a stranger, the stranger. Thou, a summer child, the summer child. Wilt thou not quickly cast it from thee? For it is not right, and it is not just, that those engaged in song should perish by the mouths of those engaged in song. On the other hand, we find Japanese poets much more inclined to praise the voices of night crickets than those of semi. There are countless poems about semi, but very few which commend their singing. Of course, the semi are very different from the cicada known to the Greeks. Some varieties are truly musical, but the majority are astonishingly noisy. So noisy that their stridulation is considered one of the great afflictions of summer. Therefore, it were vain to seek among the myriads of Japanese verses on semi for anything comparable to the lines of Evanus quoted above. Indeed, the only Japanese poem that I could find on the subject of a cicada caught by a bird was the following. Ah, how piteous the cry of the semi seized by the kite. Or caught by a boy, the poet might equally well have observed, this being a much more frequent cause of the pitiful cry. The lament of Nicias for the TEDx would serve as the eulogy of many a semi. No more shall I delight myself by sending out a sound from my quick-moving wings, because I have fallen into the savage hand of a boy who seized me unexpectedly as I was sitting under the green leaves. Here I may remark that Japanese children usually capture semi by means of a long slender bamboo tipped with a bird lime, or... Bochi. The sound made by some kinds of semi when caught is really pitiful, quite as pitiful as the twitter of a terrified bird. One finds it difficult to persuade oneself that the noise is not a voice of anguish in the human sense of the word voice, but the production of a specialized exterior membrane. Recently, on hearing a captured semi thus scream, I became convinced in quite a new way that the stridulatory apparatus of certain insects must not be thought of as a kind of musical instrument, but as an organ of speech, and that its utterances are as intimately associated with simple forms of emotion as are the notes of birds, the extraordinary difference being that the insects has its vocal cords outside. Here, unfortunately, um, the manuscript cuts off part of the um, part of the text, so we'll do our best here. Insect world is altogether a world of something fairies. Creatures with organs of something cannot discover the use and senses something we cannot imagine the nature, something with myriads of eyes, or with eyes something, or with eyes moving about at something, trunks and horns, creatures with their legs and bellies, or with brains in something. If some of them happen to have something of their bodies instead of inside, something not to surprise anybody. Something yet succeeded in finding any Japanese, something alluding to the stridulatory apparatus, something, though I think it is probable that such something. Certainly the Japanese have been 
something familiar with the peculiarities of something singing insects. But I should not... But I should not something me to say that their poets are in something speaking of the voices of crickets something cicada the old greek poets who ascribe insects mm, that might not be what it's saying the old greek poets who something something insects as producing music with something and feet nevertheless speak of the something songs and the chirruping of something just as the japanese poets do something mellinger thus addresses the cricket and back to the full text <laughs> oh thou art with shrill wings the self-formed imitation of the lyre Cheer up me something pleasant while beating your vocal wings with your feet. And that concludes part one of our brief foray into cicada in ancient literature. Um, my name is Marita Shustak. Check out my website, uh, maritashustak.com, if you are interested in art and the drama of personal life and thoughtful things <laughs> have a great day guys um we'll get back to the cicada soon <laughs>